Let's pray. Father, uh, Lord, tonight as we look at this again, this is this just a kind of a, a short section that we're gonna look at, but powerful. And I pray, Lord, that it would impact our lives, that, Lord, we would be men and women who are not just reading the word and, and agreeing with what's being said and maybe liking ideas or disliking ideas, but, Lord, this would impact our lives. This would touch our hearts. It would go to the core of our being, and we would understand, uh, Lord, what this is about all around us, everything going on, Lord, whether it's political or social or, or, or just things going on in our, our hearts, mental and spiritual, Lord, that we would have that understanding and we would know where we stand in this world, in this situation. So I pray, God, once again, give us ears to hear and hearts that are soft and pliable. Bless this time, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, again, we're going to kind of talk about, obviously, spiritual warfare, get back into that. We skipped a week, but we're back. And something I want us to think about and really kind of get in our hearts, the Apostle Paul is not just roaming around writing this letter. He's incarcerated, and he's incarcerated unjustly. So he's in a prison. He's probably more than likely chained to a Roman soldier, put in those things. His situation, listen, sometimes I think we read this and we think, well, that's easy for Paul to say. Think about where he's at. Think about what's going on in his personal life. And yet he's writing to encourage the church and, and bring the church to an understanding of spiritual warfare. As you think about it, listen, we read last time, right? I'm just gonna read it again briefly. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of, this dark, uh, rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Think about, you're chained, you're angry, you're unjustly you know, accused, unjustly put in a place, and here's what you say. It's not about that. It's about spiritual warfare. That's pretty powerful. And so when people say, sometimes I think they, they think, well, Paul doesn't understand. Oh, he totally understands. He totally gets it. So then as he's writing to us, and, and as we've talked about, again, I think a lot of us, we don't recognize spiritual warfare, or some of us just want to ignore it. And then some of us, we just want to whine. Because we like to, we like to whine, and we like pity parties, and we're into all of that. So, uh, Think about, think about your situation, your personal situation. God knows what you're going through. God definitely knew what Paul was going through. Why was Paul in that situation? God had a plan. Why are we in the situations we're in? God has a plan. And you know, sometimes his plan, believe it or not, sometimes his plan isn't just to make us happy. Sometimes his plan is to change us and work in us. So we, we need to get a hold of that. And then last week I told you a couple good books. I told you one, one of the good books that I like is Spiritual Warfare, or I'm sorry, The Screw Tape Letters. You know, I just think that's powerful. Me as a young Christian, when I first got saved, I, I think I shared last time. When I first got saved, like I, I remember calling, uh, call a friend, right? Phone a friend. And uh, so I remember calling up the guy who discipled me and said, I, I was like totally honest. I said, hey, I get Jesus, I get God. I even, you know, get my head around the Trinity. I'm starting to believe that. But this devil stuff, man, this is like foolishness. And they gave me screw tape letters and that really helped, really gave me an idea of what's going on. Once again, it's fiction, I understand, but it helped me understand. And then I mentioned that book and then I mentioned another book and I think I misspoke last time. It's another book, it's by William Gurnall. He's an old Puritan and uh, it's, I, I think I said it was 15,000 pages. I meant 1,500. So 1,500 pages this guy wrote. And listen, this was his messages on this section of scripture, 1,500 pages, I think 270 chapters, which means it was over 200. Think about, he probably taught on this for over a year. And as I read, every time I get in that book and I read parts of it, I don't sit down and read the whole thing. I read parts of it and you'll read a chapter and it's one of his messages and it's in depth and it's difficult to work through. And here's the thing. 12-year-old sat under his teaching and understood him. That's how bad we've gotten as a culture and as people because if I handed that to a 12-year-old today, they would like freak out. Number one, handing him a book. 
Like, what is that? And I, hey, I'm part of that. I don't, I don't hardly ever read books anymore. I read uh, uh, on my iPad and stuff. But the title of it, now get this. Here's the title, The Christian in Complete Armor. And that's his title. Now, here's his subtitle. You know how sometimes they have a title and then they have a little subtitle? This will tell you how verbose this guy is. Here's his subtitle. The saints war against the devil when a discovery is made of the grand enemy of God and his people in his policies, power, seat of his empire, wickedness, and chief design that he hath against the saints. A magazine open from whence the Christian is furnished with spiritual arms for the battle, helped with his armor, and taught to use the weapon together with, hap with the happy issue of the whole war. That's quite a subtitle, right? I mean, you read that and you go, oh, man. And then you start reading this stuff. And, and listen, man, he challenges us. Here's just a section. I, I, had, to, I had to put a little bit in here. And this is, this is great. Listen to what he writes. In heaven we shall appear not in armor but in robes of glory. But here they, the pieces of armor, are to be worn night and day. We must walk, work, and sleep in them or else we are not true soldiers of Christ. In this armor, we are to stand and to watch and to never relax our vigilance, for the saint's sleeping time is Satan's tempting time. Every fly dares venture to creep on a sleeping lion. Wow, that's some powerful stuff, huh? So that's just a taste. So I know all of you are gonna run out, find that book. Right, it's hard to find, it's, I think it's out of print again, and it's hard to find. So you have him, you know, from one of the way, way old dead guys, and then we have a current old dead guy, Martin Lloyd-Jones. Now Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote a commentary on Ephesians that's eight volumes. Some of these guys you think, man, his commentary on Romans is over 15 volumes, it took him 15 years to teach through the book of Romans. And check this out, Martin Lloyd-Jones did it on Friday night he taught through the book of Romans and packed his church every Friday night. That's kind of incredible. And so, anyway, his, his thing on, so he has eight volumes on Ephesians. Two of the volumes are dedicated to this passage. So I wrote it down. There's over 700 pages he has on spiritual warfare. Do you think these guys had some insight into the importance and how we kind of treat this as fluff and we kind of read it and go, yeah, 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 I know, but, and we kind of, you know, just like shove it in a corner or slough it off or, or don't pay attention. These guys were totally, listen, they were consumed with this because it's a reality. I believe spiritual warfare in our lives as believers is a greater reality than the world that we walk in but we don't pay attention to it. Now, I think sometimes we get heightened. You do a study and people like, then, then sometimes we get over heightened, right? And over sensitive and we see a de demon behind every bush and I don't want us to go there. But we're involved in a warfare. Once you're saved, the devil wants to destroy you and he wants to destroy your witness. He wants to destroy your testimony about God and he will do anything he can to destroy that. I love again where, where uh, Gurnall talks about every fly dares to venture and creep on a sleeping lion. Think about that. So you and I, listen, we need to understand we are in a battle. That's the bad news. The good news is Jesus has already won the war. And that's got to get in our hearts. He's victorious, so we need to understand that. So, again, we read 10 through 12 last time. This time we're going to do verse 13. We're going to go really fast through all of this. I'm trying to catch up to Lloyd-Jones and make it long. But listen, verse 13 says, therefore, so he's told us what's going on. He's told us who we fight against, who we wrestle against. He says, so therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. We talked about the armor of God last time. And this time, what I find interesting is he says, take up the whole armor not just pieces of it. 
So I think some of us are familiar with pieces of it, although we may not look at it that way that I just have a piece of it. But, you know, hey, we may be strong in one area and weak in another area, and I think about it. I love what Gurnall says. We need to be wearing this stuff all the time. We need to have that belt of truth on, that breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shoes, the shield. We need to have the sword. We need to have that ready at all times. Something that, you know, I remember from basic training when they drug me into the army is, listen, when you got ready and you did things, you didn't go out halfway. You went out fully prepared. Every time you went out, you were fully prepared to engage in, in you know, quote, warfare. Well, that's the same with us. We need to be fully ready. So the first thing I want us to notice in verse 13 is number one, he draws, therefore, since we are involved in a battle, and this battle is against spiritual forces that are unseen for the most part, you and I then, here's the thing, you're not gonna fight them with conventional weapons. You're not gonna fight them with you know, conventional methods. You've got to change how you're gonna approach this. And so here's what he says. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Now last time I emphasized, and I'm gonna overemphasize, and I'm gonna do it every time. This is the armor of God. I think Gurnall said in one place that it's God's armor, he's just letting us use it. I kind of like that, right? I kind of like the idea that what I have is really God's, he's just letting me use it to protect myself. So, and we have to take up all of it. We can't just take up pieces of it. We can't choose our favorite part and, and do that. And yet, you know, I think again, culturally and the way we're even wired, I think we like to pick and choose. That's not good. Take it all. I like the whole idea, it's all or nothing. And I think we should be that kind of people. So, so listen man, he hounds us about that, that we take up all of it, and then notice what he says, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Oh man, you talk about people writing a lot. What, what is evil day? What does he mean by evil day? Is the evil day a day? Is the evil day a time frame? Is the evil day a period? Is he talking about the end times? What is he exactly talking about? And again, when people get those kind of questions to me, I like to answer this. Yes. He's talking about all of that. Listen, our day could change to an evil day like that because something can happen and something can come our way. And if we are not, listen, if we're not aware, we're not paying attention, if we're kind of, quote, sleeping, you're gonna get a bunch of flies on you. And they're gonna be crawling all over you and they're gonna be coming at you. Gurnall went on to write about sleeping people and uh, I, I like what he wrote. He says, hey, Samson lost his hair when? When he was asleep. Interesting. Saul lost his spear when? When he was asleep. And then he even talked about Noah. Noah was kind of abused by one son when? when he was asleep. So we need to think about something. We need to be aware, and we need to be aware the days are evil. That doesn't mean, listen, doesn't mean there's a demon behind every bush. Doesn't mean you need to go Satan hunting. You need to understand, and we're gonna talk about this in a little bit, you're living in a con constant conflict because you're part, listen, you're part of a system that doesn't fit in this world. And we have to recognize that and understand that. And it always cracks me up as Christians when we get uptight when the world does something that doesn't agree with our, listen, with our worldview, our thoughts, and we get freaked out and I'm thinking, it's the world. Why do we freak out when the world acts like the world? We need to understand that, but once again, our battle's not against the things that even we can touch and we can look at. They're against the principalities and powers and, and evil uh, 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 of, of the heavenly places. But he says, listen, take up the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. If you work through this, he brings up standing a lot. And, you know, I was tempted to say, while we do the study, everybody stand up and like kind of get us in the mood. But I knew you guys wouldn't. <laughs> I've tried stuff like that before. You guys are rebellious. <laughs> no, we're not standing up. But I think we could interchange the words for stand. I think we could say, just be aware. Be ready. Be prepared. 
doesn't necessarily mean you have to be on your feet, but you need to be somebody, and you need to be somebody, I believe, that's immu- immovable. You're gonna be somebody, you're not gonna get pushed around by the culture, you're not gonna get pushed around by worldview, you're not gonna get pushed around by, by you know, people coming against you, you're gonna take a stand and you're gonna stand on what you believe and you're gonna be strong in that. And here's the thing, to do that, you gotta know what you believe, but more importantly, you gotta know why you believe what you believe. And I think a lot of us as Christians, we fall short there. We don't really understand why I believe what I believe. Some of us will say, well I believe it because that's what my parents said or that's what the pastor teaches, or whatever. Why do you believe what you believe? Because this spiritual warfare is not necessarily gonna attack you physically. I think sometimes it can be a physical attack. I would say 90% of spiritual warfare is right here. Spiritual warfare is usually not even conflict with others, it's right here. And this goes on in our heads. And we get doubts and we get things thrown at us and we, we have to figure things out. And until we know, why do I believe that? Why do I say that's true? Why do I believe in a resurrection? Now, how about getting down to the basics? Why do I believe this thing we call the Bible? Why do I believe that? Well, because that's what Christians do. No, why? Why do I believe it's true? And we start answering that and we work through that. And here's the thing, you start working through those things, then you become what, you know, in the theological world, we like to call them apologists. All of us, I think, listen, all of us have theology. People tell me, no, I don't. Yes, you do. Everybody has theology. Some of you have really bad theology, but you have theology. And we all, listen, we all have a belief system that we're buying into. And our belief system, if it's not based on the word of God, we're gonna get in trouble. And we're not gonna be able to stand, especially on that evil day, we're not gonna be able to withstand the things that onslaught us day by day by day. And I believe right now, at least in the United States of America, the onslaught is huge. And you're either gonna get caught up in getting angry and debating and arguing and fighting or you're gonna fight it spiritually. And if you fight it spiritually, here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna come out stronger. You're gonna come out as a person who you know your God, you know how you relate to your God, you know what your God can do, quote, for you, and you're gonna walk in that. Doesn't mean, listen, it doesn't mean we're always happy, doesn't mean it's always good, Paul right now is tied to a, a, in jail to a, I was gonna say to a sailor, but probably to a soldier. <laughs> I don't know why that popped in my head, but listen, man, and he's in that, pro, and he's saying, listen, you guys, withstand, listen, withstand the evil day. Do you know what he's telling us? It's gonna be evil. I know it's always hard whenever I think about, you know, trying to evangelize and trying to, you know, give an invitation to people. I kind of always hate the idea that you got to tell them, hey, you're not promised a bed of roses. I know some evangelists want to do that. If you just accept Jesus, everything will be wonderful. How many of you can raise your hand and say, that's true? Yeah, I mean, life gets hard. And honestly, you accept Jesus, life's going to get harder because now you're going against the flow. You're going against the grain. So withstand that evil day. So having said that, listen, I, 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 as we look at this, I'm like, yes, let's do that. And then I was taken back. That's where I wanna go. Go to John 16. We'll come back here and talk about standing again at the end. But go to John 16. Pick it up in verse 30, uh, 31. Jesus is in the upper room, right? Most of us know this scenario. John 13, he washes the feet. John 14, he, he talks uh, and, and ministers to him. John 15, he talks about the, the vine and the branches. So listen, man, he's just, here's the thing. Jesus knows he's about to die, and he's pouring in this last night. He's pouring everything into the disciples that he can pour into them. It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like he's like unscrewed their heads and pouring everything in. He's going to screw their heads back on when he's done. And he's just 
just giving him everything he can. And listen to what he says here. In verse 31, he says, Jesus answered them, do you believe? Now, just pause there for a moment and just think about, you're in that room with Jesus. He's washed your feet. So number one, here's what you know. You're a dork because you don't wash anybody's feet, right? You kind of picked up, I mean, Jesus kind of like put you in your place and, and he's done that. He's washed your feet. In John 14, he says, listen, I'm going away and where I'm going, you don't know. And everybody kind of accepted that, but Thomas, right? Thomas is going, hey, Jesus, over here. I don't know where you're going. I know you think I know where you're going, but I don't know where you're going. Can you tell us where you're going and, and how to get there? And remember, that's when Jesus says, what? Tommy? I think he really loved Tommy. He says, Tommy, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Tommy goes, yes. And then Jesus says, hey, you guys, I am the vine, you're the branches. And he goes through that whole thing. And then he gets here and he says, do you believe? Do you believe? Listen, not do you think it's true, do you believe? Are you, are, here's what he's asking them. Are you guys hiding this in your heart? Do you understand everything I just told you? And are you really in a place where you're gonna stand on that? Because here's the thing. Look at the next verse. Do you believe, he says, he says, verse 32, indeed the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Here's what he's telling them. You better believe because I'm about to leave. And guess what? I'm not gonna be around. Now, try and get that in context of these guys, and I think for some of us, because some of us, I think, are in the mode where, you know what, Jesus is gonna take care of me no matter what, it's all gonna be good, you know, I'm gonna do, no. We gotta believe him, we gotta walk with him. We gotta have that faith, listen, not faith in faith, we gotta have that faith in a God who's revealed in scripture. And Jesus says, I'm not gonna be here, and you guys are gonna, Here's something even crazier. You're not even gonna have each other. Do you believe? Now, I think a lot of us are thinking, ah, that's kind of not what I signed up for because someone told me Jesus had a wonderful plan for my life. And I want the wonderful. I think he does have a wonderful plan for your life. I think just his definition of wonderful and our definition of wonderful are two different things. He wants to grow us up. He wants to make us strong. He wants us to be men and women who can walk through fire. It's always interesting to me when we sing songs and some of the things we sing and I'm thinking, oh, I'm not so sure we believe any of this. <laughs> but we sing it. And some of us sing it with all of our heart, but is it here? So he's challenging these guys. Then he says this, and all, all of that to get to really verse 33. He says, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace but in the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Do you hear what Jesus just said? Because I think this is important for our culture and for right now and for spiritual warfare. You're either in Christ or in the world. There's no, two pla there's no other place. And we need to understand that. And if you're in Christ, you are gonna have conflict with the world. He's laid that out and he said that your ideas are going to be different. You're gonna think differently, you're gonna do things differently, you're gonna walk differently, and you need to know that. If you're in Christ, the world, the world gets kinda, to me, it gets like, it gets real fuzzy and real weird and I look at things and here's what I think. I just don't belong here. I feel like a foreigner sometimes. Sometimes I feel like a freak. I know I'm from Bisbee, but other than that. <laughs> sometimes I think, I think, man, how come, how come this is happening and it seems so strange to me? And Jesus says, because you trust me and you're gonna walk with me. The book of Job, I kind of like the book of Job but I don't like the book of Job. I'll never teach Job again. Twice I taught Job and twice I went through Job and had to do Job-like things. One, I, my leg almost got ate off, so I'm not doing that anymore. 
But Job, I love Job because, you know, and I, I've talked to people, I've talked to theater people, I wish somebody would do a play of Job. Just a, like a simple play because, and, and even in our, in our reading, when we read through it, I've even divided it up so you're, you're reading like a script. You read, you know, one guy's argument, then Job's answer. Then the next guy's argument, then Job's answer. So we kind of understand what was going on because it's kind of hard. Sometimes if you're just reading Job, you're going, I don't get it. So you got to lay it out that way. But what I love about Job is he got all these guys around him, not all these guys, but three guys, and they're going, dude, you're a dork and you did this and this is why God's doing that. And, you know, then the other guy says, you know, you did this and that's why God's doing that. And another guy, you don't believe enough, that's why God's doing that. And then you got the punk that shows up, right? The young guy, I know everything, and all of you are wrong. And Job, here's the problem. And then I love, man, after all of that, it's like Job is to me ready to crumble. Now, I know he went through all the hardship, but that had to like just pile on, right? And remember that the next time you're ministering to somebody, when they're drowning, don't hand them a, you know, a cinder block to help them out. Right? And he's like, he's like I think he's ready to cl- collapse, and then God shows up. And God in Job, in Job chapter 42, listen, God had spoke to him, and then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything. Don't you love this? Listen, all he has is the bad dialogue with the three guys and a young guy, and then the good monologue with God. And God talked to him, he says, listen, so now I know. Do you get that way? When you read your Bible, do you come to the understanding that God can do everything? You come away with, that's my God. My God is being revealed to me. And then he goes on and he says, listen, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. True or false? Yeah. Listen to, listen to all of this about spiritual warfare. And you asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Listen, please let me speak. You said, I will question you and you shall answer me. Now listen to what he says. Verse five. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Did Job see God? No. No. He didn't have a physical representation of God in front of him. How did he see God? Through God's word. And God revealed himself. And you and I, if we're gonna get involved in spiritual warfare, the first thing we have to understand is if we're in Christ, we're not part of this world system. And this world system is not gonna like us. Didn't like Jesus, not gonna like us. And we shouldn't be shocked about that. Now again, I'm not saying you should be a jerk for Jesus and go out and be antagonistic and cause people not to like you. That's just dumb. I hear people, I I even had a friend who was a missionary who brought uh, persecution upon himself and then started, oh, I'm so persecuted. I go, no, you're not, you're dumb. There's a big difference, persecution and dumb, and you're dumb. He got kicked out of Mexico for being dumb. So anyway, long story, but hey, so don't, when I'm saying we're not part of the world, I don't want you to go out and start, you know, antagonistically attacking the world. That's not how we're to function. But we need to understand the world doesn't like us. Doesn't like our thoughts, doesn't like our values, doesn't like who we are. So, you know, Jesus makes that clear. We're either in him or in the world. Now, why do bad things happen then? Why do things And I know all of us think this way. I don't think I'm the only one. When something happens, why did that happen to me? Right? Why me, Lord? And when I'm quiet and listen, he goes, why not? And I go, oh, really? And I'm not saying every little thing that happens in our life has a purpose or is part of a demonic thing. But we need to understand we are in a war, a battle, and we need to have that whole armor on. And we need to understand there's two sides. There's not all these other sides, and I'm gonna get into this cultural thing in a minute. There's two sides, those who are in Christ and those who are outside of Christ. I like to say it this way. In the world, there's two races. Those who are part of Jesus and those who are not part of Jesus. And right now, our culture is getting so mixed up in all of this that things are like 
so freaky right now. And here's the thing, as believers, we get caught up in that. Why are we caught up in that? Why aren't we caught up in the Bible? Why aren't we caught up in walking with God and, and, and loving God and honoring God? Why aren't we people who we just are convinced that our God, as Job said, nothing is gonna thwart his plans. And we walk in that and we realize that. In 1 Peter, listen, I, I, I like this one. In 1 Peter chapter five, Peter says this, be vigilant or be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking, seeking who he may devour. So let's put that in the context of what we're looking at. Jesus said, in me, you will have peace. In the world, you're gonna have tribulation. But don't get freaked out because I've overcome the world. That doesn't mean you're not gonna have tribulation. It means you shouldn't get in freak mode, right? I've overcome the world. And then Paul tells us, put on a whole armor of God, stand firm that you may, or that you may put on armor that you may withstand the evil day and therefore stand firm and I'm gonna add, in Christ. And now Peter tells you and I, we need to be sober, we need to be vigilant, why? Our adversary, the one who wants to get us, he prowls around like a lion. Now if you watch any nature shows, I've not been with a real lion in real life, but I've seen nature shows, they're pretty crafty things. Like my wife just adopted two kittens and they're pretty sneaky. You know, they sneak around and do things. And, and uh, you know, cats are that way, man. They sneak on you and they, they do crazy things. And you, where did you come from? That's the devil. <laughs> Not my cats. <laughs> I do want dinner tonight. Not the cats, I'm not talking about the cats, I'm talking about the devil is crafty and he sneaks around. And when you least expect it, he gets you. Like when you're sleeping, Samson, Saul, others, somebody's, get that quick. <laughs> Whatever that was, you gotta buy coffee for that row, so just, I don't know if you know that rule, so. But, Man, he's coming after us, and we need to know that, and we need to understand that, and we need to get our eyes off of things. I think of the things in my lifetime, you know, that I've walked through personal things, that I'm not gonna share all the personal things, but, you know, it seems like things, like, hit me, and it seems like when things hit me, they come, like, in bunches, and it's okay, it's all right, and some of them are physical, some of them are mental, you know, and some of them are just attacks from people, and I get it, but I just think, Globally, things that have, we've walked through are maybe not always globally, but at least in, in our country and, and things we had. Remember 9-11? That was 20 years ago almost. Do you remember how that changed our country for a while? We weren't so concerned about gnawing and biting and clawing at each other. We joined together to go through that. And it's just when I think about that, I think of the, Remember the tsunami? Didn't hit here, but globally. And how even that brought people together and around those things. And, and you have all of those things. And, and then now in our, in our world today, it's so, I don't, to me, I want to say so violent, so mixed up, so crazy of the things going on. And it just doesn't make any sense unless, listen carefully, unless you believe in spiritual warfare. Otherwise, it's just crazy. And I don't think it's crazy. I think it's orchestrated. And I think it's on purpose. And I'm not talking political parties. I'm talking demonic and God. And there's things going on when I, you know, I read about cancel culture and I read about woke. You know how you need to get woke, people? By being born again. You need to go from death to life. You need to be people who you quit sleeping and you start walking with Jesus. And we need to get into this more. We need to get away from fighting all of this, you know, LGBTQ AI. I don't know what AI stands for. I think alternative intelligence. But, sorry. 
<laughs> you have all that stuff going on. You have, listen, you have all of these things happening and, and people are buying into it and people are getting involved in it and even the church is doing things. And I'm thinking, as a church, our responsibility is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ so people are born again. When people are born again, lives are changed and then, listen, then you can get involved in a real fight. All of that stuff is fake fighting. Do you ever watch a WWE? Do not raise your hand. <laughs> listen, that's, for those of you who are hung up in that, it's fake. I know, that's a shock. That's all of that other stuff. Do you ever watch UFC? Don't raise your hand. That's real. That's the Jesus stuff. We're involved in a real battle. And we get caught up in WWE. You guys are gonna remember this now. That's not even in my notes. I don't even know where that came from. But you're gonna remember this now. You're caught up in the WWE and you're, you know, I would name some of the people, but that would get me in trouble. But hey, you're involved in that. And over here, listen, over here a real battle's going on and you're oblivious. And you know who's happy? Satan. Saints, let's pay attention. This is the real deal. Don't get involved in all of that. I, you know, again, I, I read stuff and I look at stuff and I think, how did our world get there so quickly? And yet we're there. And I don't want to get caught up in the fluff. I want to be involved in the real thing. And each one of us have a responsibility. Listen, if you're a believer, the devil wants you to get caught up in that other stuff so you're not caught up in a real battle. The real battle is for people's souls and for people's salvation. And that's where we need to be. So go back again. Go back over to, to uh, I was going to say to Genesis, but we might do Ephesians instead of Genesis. Let's go back to Ephesians. And once again, just look at this verse, because I want us to just have this deep in our hearts. He says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. I think we all face evil days at different times. And I don't think he's talking about a specific, I think he's talking about life. But I wanna get to the point, are we standing? Are we people who are ready? And you're ready for the battle. You're not snoozing someplace, you're ready for the battle and you're ready to fight it and you're not, listen, you're not gonna look at all the peripheral. He hangs all these things. Look at this little fruit over here. You know, what about this? What about that? What about this? And we get caught up in all of that and what, whatever it is. I know I talked about some hot button issues, but how about, you know, how about even simple little things about, you know, hey, do you wear a mask or don't wear a mask? Do you take the vaccine or don't take the vaccine? Come on. All of that is stuff we shouldn't be caught up in as a Christian. We should let people make up. I think we're adults. That's kind of what I feel. That's why we have an adult service in kids. Make up our minds and then walk in it and don't listen. I don't expect you to tell me how to live my Christian life and I'm not gonna tell you how to live your Christian life. I don't want you to listen. There's things that stumble me that probably are not a problem for you. I'm not gonna tell you to stay away from those things because they stumble me. And the same goes with all those issues. Listen, the peripheral issues are silly to fight and argue and get upset. And the church is doing it now and it's like driving me bonkers. It's like, stop it. Let's focus on what we need to focus on. And that's Jesus Christ and him crucified and get that message out and go that direction. That's where we need to be. And that's my heart. So hey, I think when I signed up to pastor, I surely didn't sign up for all the things I've been through as a pastor. I thought it was easy. And what God has taken me through blows my mind. And, he, and you know what? Things are still coming my way. And I'm going, seriously? I mean, why are we doing this now? And I told God, actually today, I learned the lesson, let's stop. Like, I try and let him in on things so, so we're on the same page. And it seems like, listen, it seems like it just keeps coming and coming. Why? Because there's a battle. And I need to be prepared. And here's what I need to know. 
If the Apostle Paul can sit in a dungeon chained to some stinking Roman soldier, I don't know if he's stinking, but some Roman soldier, he's probably stinking, and know that it's all bogus, and he can write this, then you know what? My life's pretty easy, and I should be able to walk that, not just read it, walk it and live it. So that's what we need to do, saints. Put on the whole armor, and now in the next few times, we're gonna talk about the different pieces of armor, what they are, how we're gonna wear them, and what they mean in our, in our spiritual warfare. But none of it does any good if we don't realize I'm in a battle. And the evil day is today and tomorrow and the next day. And I need to fight with all I'm worth to walk with Jesus. Let's stand up and pray. Father, I do thank you. I thank you for the challenge in your word. I thank you tonight as we just look at this and and think about it. Lord, I pray, I pray for myself, I pray for those standing with me that we would do a self-evaluation. I've had to stop and look at things in my life and look about what's going on and, and get a handle on things and begin to understand. There's a war going on. I need to be educated in that war and there's nothing wrong with looking into things and getting some education. But God, in the midst of that, I don't need to get caught up in the peripheral. But I need to get caught up in the real battle and the real things that are going on. So Jesus, I pray for myself, I pray for my brothers and sisters. God, that you would do a work in our hearts that only you can do, that only you can accomplish. And God, that we would be men and women that are committed to walking with our God. We would be men and women who are committed in the place where we are going to glorify you and honor you with the things we do, the things we say. And God, that people would come to realize there is a God in heaven. And that God in heaven is real and he cares. And I'm gonna ask you to stay in attitude of prayer for another couple moments. And if you are here tonight and you don't know Jesus, then you know what? This is gonna sound really weird, but you're really not in a battle because you're not, you're not, you're, you're totally absorbed into the world. So I wanna invite you to join the battle. I know that sounds kind of weird, but I wanna invite you, come to Jesus, open up your heart to him, come to him, and he does have a wonderful plan for your life. Not, not maybe in a way you think, but God is going to take you from being a person who's asleep to a person who's alive, you're gonna be somebody who you can see clearly as God opens up your eyes. So, hey, if you want that relationship, if you want your sins forgiven, if you want a relationship with a holy God that you have already offended, then you know what? Open up to him. Be real and honest with him. Jesus desires a relationship with you. He went to the cross to prove that. The bad news is you're a sinner and you're separated from God. And you need to realize that. You need to come to the point where you realize that and then you need to come to the point where you're sorry about that. Your heart is grieved over that. If you come to that place and you're honest with God, then he will meet you there. Here's the good news. Jesus took your place to pay for the penalty of your sin. And all you have to do is say yes to him. All you have to do is say, yes, I trust you. And you know what happens? You get born again. And you begin this walk with the king of the universe. So if you want that, say this prayer with me. You can say it out loud. You can say it silently. If you're home watching online, you can say this prayer with us. If you're backslidden, come back to Jesus. Say this prayer with us. Jesus, tonight I confess to you that I am a sinner. I'm sorry, God, that I sinned against you. I'm asking you right now to forgive my sins. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you, Jesus, 
for your forgiveness. Tonight, I want you to come into my heart and change me. I'm asking you right now to come into my life and guide me. Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. Father, I pray for those individuals right now that raise their hand. And Lord, I thank you. And God, I ask that you would reveal yourself to them, that you would make yourself real, and that they would know right now, in this moment, that by your blood, all of their guilt and their shame is washed away. It's gone. And by your blood, they've been set free from that bondage of sin. And God, you've clothed them in robes of righteousness. Bless and encourage them. Strengthen them and for all of us. Lord, we know that in you, we have peace. But in the world, we have tribulation. And we know that even in that tribulation, we can face it because you have overcome the world. So bless all of us as we walk with you. Bless the couple of people who made that commitment and God be glorified in our lives and we pray these things in Jesus name. Amen.